This is The Convergence. Well, hey everyone, welcome to The Convergence, where every week we talk about Web 3.0 and the convergence of that and sustainability. And I'm really excited for our guest today. Michael and I go back, oh boy, I think it's 10 plus years. I had I had a lot more hair then. Um, it wasn't gray. Uh, but we recently reconnected as I started talking about doing this show. And I, I reached out and said, hey, what's, what's Wall Street thinking about uh, Web 3.0? And Michael uh, immediately was like, whoa, wait a second. I'm working in this space. So Michael, welcome. Uh, tell us a little bit about your background. Now, CRD Analytics is where you and I met. And, and you've been a serial entrepreneur in sort of the data and analytics space for for a long time. Uh, we are definitely both in that middle age category. We've, we're not the young bucks anymore. We might still want to think we are, but uh, we've got a little experience under our belt. Maybe tell everybody a little bit about your experience with CRD and how you got into this. Sure. Yeah. It's great to see you again, Derek. So time yeah, is time is everything. <laughs> yes. So yeah, I'd say I'm a seasoned entrepreneur. So seasoned. There you go. Yeah. Five, five plus, <laughs> you know, companies, most of them with successful exits. Um, so yeah, I started off, you know, early days and then in the, in the 90s on, on Wall Street. So it was literally, you know, just after, you know, the first movie came out with Michael Douglas and Charlie Sheen. So that was my was dream. It like that? Was, it, was it just like they said in the movie? No? Yes? It was. It, yeah. was. <laughs> it was a lot of fun. You know, I mean, there were still people on the trading floor. Not like... Yeah, not like today. Hey, listen, I remember when, when you invited me to come out and ring the bell uh, with, with you, you know, I, I, you know, I just assumed that you know, there was a trading floor. It, there's not, it's just a recording studio you go into, you, you stand in the lobby, you move into there, you take the pictures, you do the thing and you're done. It's like, well, wow, that's not what you expect to see from television. <laughs> it's just zeros and one, electrons just move yes. back and forth. So that's right. Yeah, that was the NASDAQ market site. So yeah, so started off in very traditional investing, but got into ESG and sustainability kind of at the very beginning, about 15 years ago. And was just like one of those pioneers that was able to apply, you know, what I've learned in traditional Wall Street and incorporate that with ESG and sustainability. Mm -hmm. He was being able to say, here's the value of a public company between zero to 100. Here's the methodology and being transparent about that. That's yeah. what got us, you know, the attention of, of NASDAQ. Because they're like, oh, you can actually explain this. So we'll talk about, you know, how that relates to Web3. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's a, it, right, and it's a really good. It's a good intro, and I think it it helps connect the dots too. Because you know, my background started around the same time. I was working for Earth Nine One One, which was recycling database. I was uh, starting a a tech company in the space uh, that a lot of people now today, when we look back on it, we go, "Oh, it was Slack." I mean, it's pretty much what we created way back then. This internal communication platform around sustainability. The challenge was we had back then was was CEOs were saying, well, we don't want our people to talk to each other. Like, why would we want people to communicate? That's why we have walls. It's like right. little, little different environment today, but we were coming out of this environment where I believe that companies knew they had to do something around sustainability, but nobody had yet really quantified the benefit to them and, and connected the dots. And I think a lot of the work that you did helped them do that and helped them uh, get out and really tout and, and and get excited and talk about the financial metrics that were tied with diversity and all the different things that happened in that period. I mean, before that, it was a bunch of white guys on boards. And all of a sudden, when companies started to realize that diversity not only was good from the public persona, but also created environments where you had more diverse opinions, which resulted in better decision making, well, then really quickly, they were like, this is something that we need to adopt. Yeah, no, that's a great point, Derek. And I think because from the beginning, we looked at sustainability holistically, meaning mm. there was four dimensions, financial, environmental, social, and governance, where a lot yeah. of folks were focused in on the environmental. That was it. <laughs> but that yeah. diversity component, that social component, actually was double in terms of the value and the impact from investors, supply chains, and corporations, and especially yeah. you know peoples and unions. So, but the ability to quantify something that's intangible is kind of like what set us apart from the beginning. So I think, I, I think so. Yeah. So we're kind of doing yeah. that, you know, fast forward to today, you know, we've yeah. proven like, wow, there's so much value in there beyond just the environmental and the financial metrics. So. Well, and I knew when I, when I took on this project to, to create this podcast, because I'm going to be really honest and I will ask a lot of questions because I don't understand 
this web 3.0 stuff just yet. You know, I have a Coinbase account. I put cash in there. I took a percentage of my portfolio and moved it and 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 bought, you know, the two that I saw in the news, Bitcoin and Ethereum, and just moved them in there and said, well, I have to have a stake in the space. But I don't, I don't completely understand it. And I know a lot of what you're working on right now is this idea of DAOs. And, you know, I, I just sort of figured out what that was about a week ago. So maybe tell us a little bit about Apex. What was that sort of catalyst point for you that said, look, we've been able to do this in the ESG space, and maybe we should dis- define ESG. G first. Do you want to do that? So to talk about what those what what is encompassed in ESG. Sure. Yeah. So I mean, the, the terminology really resonates well with Wall Street because it is about quantitative measures of environmental, social, and governance factors. Yeah. And they love when they can say, "Okay, where's the data? Can I get it on Bloomberg? Can I get it on Thomson Reuters or Finitiv? Yes. Okay, I trust it." And that's if an analyst is reading it, that's a good sign, right? Exactly. And you can compare one company to another, a sector. You can create indexes, investable products like ETFs or mutual funds. Hmm. So that industry has really evolved where everything can be calculated. It can be institutionalized. That's places, you know, when the industry gets to that point, that's a good place for me to leave and go into another industry True. where my, my talents are really being uh, in the on the tarmac, getting into the plane that's not done and then finishing in the air. That's where I like yeah. to live. I'm very comfortable. <laughs> and that's what you sort of did with, with the NASDAQ Global Sustainability Index was, I, I think it was so early in that. I, I remember it was like when it, when it first launched, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't even easy to find online. I mean, NASDAQ was excited about it because I believe that the bigger corporations, and, and, and at that time, you know, I had just come out of a career at that time doing recycling consulting for, you know, folks like ExxonMobil and Walmart. So I knew that those conversations were happening, but the quantifiable piece of it was just so, it was so ethereal at that point. It was like, we know we have to do something. We just don't know what it is and we don't know what the result is. And that is not the way that corporate America and boardrooms like to work. Everybody wants to know the quantifiable. The, you know, you can talk about the qualitative and say, doesn't it feel good that we did this? And they're like, it. Yeah. It feels good, but that, but what, what is the end result, and what's the tangible on the flip side of that? So right. how did that how did that transition happen? So you've been working on these these sustainability indexes to allow investors and analysts to analyze the sustainability sort of roots of companies and and understand the comparisons between them and how those things translate into financial performance. What's that next step? How did you get turned on to Web three point and and how did that sort of emerge from this? Yeah. So it's, it's an interesting journey. And I think like anything, you know, you kind of watch and monitor trends, you know, like as an economist, as an analyst, yeah. like I'm always monitoring trends and you have to, you have to like kind of time it. Um, you know, you don't never want to time your investment portfolio, but, but you can time technology. You can see the critical <laughs> mass building. You can see who gets into it. So that's where I was, you know, five years ago. And I'm like, all right, what this new emerging, you know, blockchain and crypto, it's going to be powerful but it's still super, super technical and, you know, super, you know, isolated to, to a certain group. So I was like, I have time. So I waited another couple of years. And then for the past three, I've really just been researching and reading and watching and following, which is a part-time job, you know, but yeah. you have to shift your algorithms in Twitter and TikTok and all your socials. So you're immersing yourself in that information. Mm. That's when you, you know, so now I'm learning, but I'm still doing the ESG and sustainability, but I've already started to make that transition in what I'm consuming. The next yeah. thing is you start buying all the books on Amazon. And you're <laughs> reading that. So it's been, it's taken me a good two years to even yeah. feel like I could talk about it, you know, and that's somebody <laughs> who's very, very technical. And, and I'll tell you, I, I feel like overwhelmed going into this topic because I, I think I got a little too late to the game and, and I've been an entrepreneur myself most of my career. And, you know, in 2006, I helped start a company called Buildproof that made smart contracts for homeowners and remodelers that were all digital and all these kind of things. So when I look back at my career, I'm like, hey, we were participating there. In 2015, I helped launch a metaverse, uh, you know, called Hypatia that, that came out in Steam. And 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 everybody, all of the, everybody got into this thing, thousands of users in the first couple of days. And they looked around and they're like, we can't kill anybody and we can't earn any income. What are we doing here? You know, so everybody took off. And now that's sort of the trend. So uh, it, it is interesting how that happens. I do feel today though, and it's part of the reason I started this podcast was when I started turning on all those feeds, I started to realize I don't even know the lingo. Yeah. Like I don't, I don't know what a smart contract is. 
I don't know what a DAO is. I didn't even know how to spell DAO. Like, you know, I, mean, I typed it in as D-O-W looking for it. And I'm like, oh, no, it's D-A-O. And sort of learned more about that. And you explained a lot of that to me. So yeah. it is, it's hard to catch up on that trend. And, you know, maybe you feel a little like the old guy in the room when, when you missed it. Um, but that's the goal now is try to catch up. And because I think, I think we're just on the edge here of where this thing is going. No, absolutely. So I think, you know, try to differentiate between the cool factor and then mm. the utility factor. So once I was able to see the utility of Web3 and DAOs and NFTs, that was really the shift because then I could say like, well, how can I fit into this? How can I integrate this into my business? What can I do that I couldn't do before technology wise? And that's kind mm. of like where I'm today. So I think when you could take something like a DAO, which stands for Decentralized Autonomous Organization, uh, the way I explain that is it's a digital co-op. We're mm. all cooperatively owning this. And now what's really powerful, we don't even need to have monthly board meetings. We set the rules out beforehand and that's it. This many owners, this percentage, pro rata distribution of funds. This is the organization. If someone wants to get out, someone wants to get in, here's the rules. So that is streamlining wow. something that was very, very cumbersome. What that also means is instead of going the VC or angel route, we've been able to ra raise money directly from our from our base. Meaning is that through like a Reg A or Reg CF? Is that through that that change in the regulation, or how does that work in a DAO versus you? Know, because there's been a lot of regulation change in the last five years around how you can raise money, and it has changed things. It's so changed dr dramatically. So you're not because you're not dealing with many of those um, fiat currencies. Like you can have a DAO and it can be completely on the decentralized network, and you're only dealing with crypto. You've never touched a fiat bank account. <laughs> I think you just blew my mind for a second there because I, wow, I hadn't really thought about that. I've done some of these we funders and reg A's and reg CFs for companies, and there's still a ton of regulatory paperwork that goes in. And, and if you're not paying somebody like three or 4% to automate that process, it's unmanageable. I mean, to manage hundreds or thousands of shareholders that are coming in, you know, in waves that want as soon as their money hits the account, they want certificates, they want documents, uh, that's great. Wow. Now, now I'm really going to blow your mind. So okay. I, I went on to uh, Zen Business, which is based in Austin, Texas, but they have the only DAO for LLCs. They're in Wyoming. I logged on. I, I went through a series of questions with an AI chatbot. I registered Apex DAO LLC in Wyoming, paid for it, less than 500 bucks. I get all my papers. I got my investors, not really my investors. I have my members. Yeah, and now we build out a landing page. You you mint and sell NFTs. We're fully funded. I've never even done a roadshow. I've never done a pitch. I've never had to talk to a single VC or angel. The game has changed. Wow. Okay. Now, so I maybe let do, I know what to do, right? From a regular business right. standpoint. So I'm looking at like this would normally take me six oh, months. Got to get my attorney involved, and yeah, oh, totally. It's such a pain. And listen, I, I've been an exec in many companies that were early stage. I can tell you, my last company, Fat Scooters, my full time job was raising money. Yep, that's all I did was raise money, shareholder relations. I'm in uh, Carta every day, issuing certificates and dealing with options. And how does this? How does this warrant dilute this? If this warrant, exp I mean. Yeah, it, it, you have to have securities it. attorneys that are 700 bucks an hour just to answer the basic questions for you. So now let's keep going, right? So now also I have my members, right? They get pro rata distributions when money comes in. You set the terms. So I don't, if I want to, I don't even need an employee. <laughs> so you can do members, you can, they wow. still have their own full time job. So now this becomes a stream of passive income. But in the beginning, we all put in our, our collective brains and work and network. Yeah. You're setting it up to run on whatever, you know, that your your mission is, and then people still can go about their day. So we're setting up also these great forms of passive income. <laughs> to me. So let's, uh, boy, now you're making me think about businesses I could start, you know? I mean, uh, ooh, now you got me going. Okay. So <laughs> let's step back for a second, because yep. I want to assume that my listener doesn't understand what an NFT is, or uh, th th they're assuming that an NFT is well, the collections of Jay Pierce that I collect, right? It's a digital piece of artwork. So when you say I formed a company and they get an NFT that tells them about their distributions, that might be confusing. So non-fungible token is what we're talking about, right? With right. an NFT. And how how does the NFT, maybe you can explain that sort of environment. Maybe that'll help. Sure. 
And I think, you know, NFT, same thing. I think like Greenwich Village in the 60s, right? All the artists were there hanging yeah. out. But eventually, so many more other businesses and organizations came in to give it some more stability. So NFTs definitely started with the techies and the artists. But yeah. now people like us are coming in with the, the business acumen and foundation. Like, what can I solve using this? So yeah. the way I, I look at it is the NFT is a wonderful opportunity to create a contract between you and me. Hmm. There's no other, I don't need to go with a financial institution. I don't need to bring hmm. in a broker. I don't need to bring insurance companies. We are basically agreeing on the terms. Once that's set, as long as you fulfill or, and I fulfill, it's done. Everything so that would be a smart contract then, right? And then it's a smart contract right. essentially that undergirds right. that NFT, okay. Correct. So with an NFT, I can I can create a piece of artwork that is minted, meaning it's verifiable on the blockchain. There's only one of a kind and it has a discrete value. It can be sold just like a traditional piece of art, but it never degrades. Hmm. The kicker is within that smart contract, it can be very simple or it can have other conditions, meaning that if that art piece of artwork is sold by you, I get 10 percent every time it's sold so I that's what my artist experience. friends like about it they can right. get a they can get a residual yeah. forever on that piece of art their estate you know and, and that is something if you think about it and and i like to say this you know i've uh, uh, evergreen carbon credits which is one of our sponsors of this show you know they create nft carbon credits and, and i tell like people they're like well, well how do you know it's real i'm like well if there's six mona lisas here and one has a certificate of authenticity and the other five don't what is the probability that this one is real? It's pretty high because it's the one that's got the certificate of authenticity. So it really just authenticates that and provides transparency into that transaction so that people know that what they're buying is a genuine. It's not It's not a forgery or there's not a gotcha someplace in this Correct, thing. correct. And that as an artist or as a, a celebrity or a, a sports athlete, right? I can create a yeah. hundred of them, sell all 100, hmm. right? So I can control the number that I, that I mint. I could do one. I could do 100, I could do 10,000. So as you can imagine, a, a author who already has a following base, a restaurant owner, a musician who already has a following saying, hey, I'm doing something new here. You, my fans, would you like to support me? In exchange, you're going to get the free book, but you're also going to get a two-hour interview with me talking about my process and writing the book or developing the movie. So it doesn't have to just be a tangible asset. And I think that's what people, th th there's this, you know, it's like if I buy NFT art, is it real or isn't it? I think there's this big question, but I think if we think about it in the terms of a certificate, right, of authenticity, something that is a contract that is just a verifiable contract and it's verified by the blockchain. And for those of you who don't, we're going to talk on an episode about blockchain because it's fascinating how it works. I mean, it's essentially, there's a million computers around the world that whenever you make a change to that contract, to that, to, to that code, they all have to validate it. And if they don't, it doesn't work. So it is a super secure network, super easy way to transfer money. I think even with the Ukraine, they're saying, you know, a lot of people are trading in cryptocurrencies right now because they're easy to get and they're not fraudulent. Correct. <laughs> so, Correct. And there's no one to stop it. You can do direct. Right. The, the direct. Is that a threat you think to government or do you think government just eventually just embraces this and says, instead of fiat currencies, we've got to create our own uh, you know, I, I just wonder that. I guess it maybe is a question for another episode, but I, I'd say the short answer is, is yes. That one, it scares the heck out of them, and two, they're already putting into place. Like China already has their digital currency. That's why they didn't want Bitcoin, so they can control it. Oh, the U.S. already has their own stable coin. So there's going to be federal crypto stable coins that'll just replace, you know, the fiat dollar. It has to. That, It'll be that, digital that, currency. Yeah. So I can see a lot of sustainability applications for this. When I think about one of, I just uh, landed a guest, gr great guy named Adam Smalls is going to be on the show. He has a, a company called Diamond Ancestry, and he literally creates a smart contract for every diamond that comes out of the ground in one area of the world. And then uh, he passes that contract through the whole entire supply chain. So when you go to the diamond store to buy that ring for your fiance, you can either buy one of these diamonds that there's a questionable ancestry on it, or you can buy this that has this certified the whole way through that you know exactly which miner took it out of the ground and where it came from and all those kind of things. I think from a from a end of life product stewardship or just a product stewardship in general, this creates pretty amazing opportunities. Oh, absolutely. And I think when sustainability is at play, like, you know, the only limitation is our imagination. 
Yeah. So I think we can do some really great stuff directly that are very, very obvious. And I think there's a lot of things that I'd like to talk about if we have time. Yeah, we do. That could solve That's it. a great thing. We can make this into two episodes if we need to. I think it's it's been good. We've been setting that sort of ground because I want to make sure that before we get into talking about Apex, that, that people have at least a basic knowledge and understanding of how this works. So let's make that transition. So American Polling Exchange. Um is this for shareholder voting? Is this for like, what, what's the, what's the basis? I, and I know that there's a lot of different use cases. I've read through all the data and I'm like, this is really pretty cool. You can see how it is transformative to many marketplaces, not just corporations. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, this is like an idea that it's been marinating for several, several years that I've wanted to do. The technology still wasn't in place. Yeah. So what we're looking at is civics based education, right. But leveraging Web3 and NFTs and PDP and all this, all the, the alphabet soup, which I'll explain in a second. So a lot of the polling in the surveys done, you don't have any data in terms of who conducted that. It's done on, on a, ah. a survey online. So you're getting that feedback. So that person may or may not be an American citizen. And I think that's a little bit tough when it comes to data integrity. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. The other ones where they do know the people, it's on a landline, which we know is, is a problem that you know, beyond yeah. the, certain generations just don't have landlines anymore. So you're getting no. like a little bit of a bias there. With Web3 and digital IDs, we can know exactly who the person is, you know, on our side, you know, what their age group is, you know, mm -hmm. whether they're American citizen or not, you know, all the great demographics, very specific. And then you can roll that up to saying, look, this may be the number one issue in America, but if you're running as a, as a campaign or as, you know, as a policymaker, imagine being able to say, this is the exact majority hmm. priority in Arizona, you know, in district 14 or in New York yeah. state in congressional district 34. So like, Boy, that's, that's really powerful. It, I mean, I can just think right now, there's so much political, uh, you know, conversation that happens out there that is really dictated by the voices of a few, uh, you know, when it comes out here, I am in Arizona and we talk about, people talk about the border problem all the time. And every time I'm back east, people are like, is it terrible? I'm like, we're trying to get more, <laughs> like we need a lot more immigrants coming across the border and we embrace that. And they're like, right. we thought it was like this big drug land and gang wars. And we're like, nah, it's, right. there's places, there's times where those kind of things happen. But for the most part, people here in the Southwest understand that, you know, you have to embrace uh, immigrants because we all ourselves are immigrants here. Right. You know, Arizona, I've been here 19 years and I think I'm probably me and maybe the governor have been here longer. I mean, yeah. It's a very transient society. So uh, I could see how that could be really beneficial because it is being dictated by New York, the conversation that of what's happening here in Arizona. Yeah. So and I, I want to back up for a second. Yeah, but, so like, I, like I said, we're focused in on the issues, meaning, right. you know, inflation. Great. Let's talk about inflation. We're talking about gas prices, heating mm -hmm. oil, food, construction, like you, you need to get into the details. You need to have context. If you want to have a civics based conversation, well, you need to kind of understand, you know, a lot of the rules that come in this country. So because, you know, a lot of the the education that you and I grew up with, where we yeah. rigorously had to understand the Constitution and civics and debate and, and critical thinking, you know, th that has shifted. We're going to get back to those roots. So when I say we're going to have um, videos that f folks are going to watch, educational videos, just like Schoolhouse Rock. Everyone yeah. like, oh, yeah, where it's just the facts. It's not a cultural thing. Yep. It's not a political thing. It's just the facts backed up by like science and data. So we're going to have a more educated folks of, of people who are taking the polls as well as taking paid surveys. Because surveys, you really need context. You need to be like, what view are we looking at? What perspective? What are we trying to solve? But really be able to get into that. Now we take that data, we we roll it up, and we, you know, one of my specialties around analytics. We want yep. to make that information actionable. So here's the problem. Here's the challenges standing in the way that you see us solving that problem. And then mm. here are a couple solutions. What can we agree upon? And the whole thing is to put together focus groups from people from all sides of the spectrum, from all different generations mm. of all parts of the country. It's the diversity of thought that is going to allow us, empower us to come up with these solutions and actually enact them in our communities. So it's well, it's a, it's a, you're, you're explaining a true democracy. <laughs> you know? we'll figure it. We are in a republic and we're in a republic because it's impossible to get everybody to vote on everything. But I could see how this technology and what you're doing 
could radically alter that. I mean, local politics in particular, where, you know, it's like we're voting on something for our school or something for our community. It's really difficult because the people who who, who might have the most, you know, the, the, the loudest voices are probably the people that have kids in that school and not the people that live across the street from the school that could right. be affected by that. And I think that creates a lot of contention in our society because we're not we're not all communicating on that same level with the same understanding. Exactly. So this whole this whole process, you know, like I said, is enabled by this this new technology. So the way that Web3 comes into play, well, someone can come onto that platform. The digital ID, right, allows them to say, okay, this is the amount of information I'm willing to share with you. Hmm. The great thing is it's up to them. So data yeah. privacy is they're empowered by that. So the big difference between web three and web two is centralization versus decentralization. So all data that goes into Facebook. Mark Zuckerberg has access to sure all does. data that goes into Amazon. Yeah, has access to. Yeah, I mean? it goes up literally to the top of the organization yeah. executive suite. Where when a decentralized, the person is in control. So the person mm -hmm. is empowered. They have data sovereignty, meaning they control their own information and how much they want to release. Now, the way you make it in incentivize is well, you're going to level up fill up more of your profile. If you want to share more, totally up to them, but then you will level up, you'll get more tokens, you'll get more rewards, you can participate in, in cash payouts for, for town halls and focus groups. That's so, we always give them the incentive, but it's yeah. always up to them. And that's how you get, you get fun, but there's yeah. always has to be like, well, what's in it for me? Here it is. Right. Well, and then I can imagine too, that as people has progressed through their lives and their opinions might be altered or changed, you know, having some visibility and transparency into that data could be really powerful to understand how something like coronavirus, I think coronavirus shifted a lot of people's perspectives on a lot of things. And I think in some senses, it pushed a lot of people farther right. I think, you know, the January 6th, uh, I've had a lot of conservative friends that the January 6th event uh, completely changed their political landscape, right? They're, they're very much changed. So I think that's interesting too, is so with what you're working on, it, because the user controls that profile, I mean, can, can they share historical information and historical views through that as well? Absolutely. Wow. Absolutely. That's huge. I mean, I, I know my political, my opinions change every day. I think, I think, good, uh, well-educated, thoughtful people's opinions change all the time. You know, and I ask people this when we have dinner parties, I'm like, what's the last huge change in your opinion where you just shifted 90 degrees? And for the most part, a lot of people can go, oh yeah, what was this? It was this on religion. It was this on uh, transgender. It was this on immigration. And some of that is just exposure. You know, it's, it's hard to have an opinion on something like transgender if you've never met anybody who was transgender right. you know it's 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 hard to you know if you've lived in a community of all white people it's hard to, to to embrace other people because you see them as different from you instead of recognizing the similarities 100 percent. and That's i think that, you know there's a, there's a lot of blame to go around right now and i just yeah. don't see it as helpful it's not. so if we can start talking about all right well what's what are the challenges standing in the way what do we have in our control what can we agree upon and how can we move forward but that's, that's a whole right. discussion and it doesn't belong on Facebook. It belongs, you know. No, and in, in Michael, I told, this, I told this story years ago where one of the first meetings that I went in with with oil executives, when we were talking about uh, motor oil recycling back in the mid-2000s. And I went and sat down with oil executives. And, of course, they assumed that I was going to come in in, a, in, in Birkenstocks and, and, and you know, a, a Grateful Dead T-shirt and have this conversation. And uh, when we first sat down, I said, look, uh, the first thing that you're going to notice with this presentation is I'm never going to mention the word climate change or global warming. We're here to talk about pollution. And everybody in the room, all these executives were like, yeah, pollution. That's something we want to do something about. <laughs> I'm thinking it's the same damn thing. <laughs> they, they just... It's just the word was so inflammatory at that time that you had to use a different phraseology. You had to you had to relate it to you wouldn't want your kids swimming in a pool with uh, that somebody poured you know uh, ammonia into. And they go, no, of course I wouldn't. Well, that's pollution. And then once you can sort of build those common grounds, and I think that's what I'm seeing with what you're doing is you're finding these ways to build those sort of common grounds and common threads that then can be expanded upon and make change. Absolutely. You know, I, I come it. from I come from a household of educators and engineers. So you, know, <laughs> you, were, things, you were destined for this. <laughs> those are two powerful tools, right? <laughs> it, it's hard to do anything, you know, as an event. But if you look at it as the whole system and you say, like, all right, how can we build this where everyone can participate? 
it's fun to participate. There's some reward and it's, you have to have those two key words, right? Frictionless yeah. and stickiness. Yeah, both, right. So you don't leave. And how do I make sticky so you want to keep coming back? Yeah, you want to keep coming Gamification is, yeah. is it. You ever played the game Clash of Clans? Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah. It's, 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 you can't stop. No, I have a friend that's like, he, some months he's like, I can't believe how much money I spent on that stupid game. <laughs> but I'm a gamer too. I've always been a gamer. I've worked in the gaming industry before. So I am I still have an Xbox. I still put the headset on on Saturday nights at, at 11 o'clock after the wife goes to bed and play with a couple of my buddies from high school. And, you know, but there is that stickiness. There's that keep coming back. And some of it is community. Some of it is that autonomous, you know, being, being able to, to, to create your own sort of destiny in a game like that. Uh, but But having some sort of purpose as well really keeps i think it was daniel pink that talked about that autonomy mastery and purpose those yeah. are the three reasons that something becomes super sticky yeah and uh i could uh, that that's very cool so i think that's a big area that we haven't quite seen yet that will, will really help solve problems when it comes to sustainability because mm -hmm. if you make it if you you want to tie in people's personal accountability which like not just their yeah. footprint but their peers, their network. So being able to show it, being able to display it, um, having to start social entrepreneurs saying instead of just making a game to play for entertainment with no, you know, inherent value, right? No intrinsic value to other than entertainment. That's a game shifter. So I have a friend mm -hmm. across the river who created a Web3 company. They're selling NFTs. You're buying virtual land in the Amazon rainforest. And Interesting. At the level, they'll set it oh. up with sensors. You can watch your plot of land. Wow. Like owning it, but you're investing in 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 the the cultivation and the protection sure. of that. And then they take that money and then they give it to the people on the ground to take care of the land. So just that in and of, it, yeah. in and of itself is like, okay, that's innovative. That's interesting. Michael, thank you so much. Folks, if you would like to find Michael, the best thing to do is Google him. <laughs> His last name is M-U-Y-O-T. And uh, you can find him on LinkedIn. And I'm sure as the site and everything becomes more public, uh, you'll find lots of press releases and things out there, and uh, and go check out the work that he's done in the past too. It's truly amazing, and I am uh, I'm always uh, excited to uh, have conversations uh, with you about the future of where we are going uh, with our with our world and with our climate. So, hey, thanks again, Michael. Appreciate you very much. Thanks for listening to the Convergence. If you want more information about the topics you've heard here today, reach out to us at theconvergencepodcast.com.